Hey everyone, good morning. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're going to start. This is the public portion of our workshop. Uh, so we're going to use the hashtag AbolishBigData2019 if you choose to tweet this part of the event. Uh, and I'm super excited to present our speaker today, Yeshi Milner, founder and executive director of Data for Black Lives. Uh, Yeshi has worked behind the scenes as a movement builder, technologist, and data scientist on a number of campaigns. She started Data for Black Lives because for too long she straddled the worlds of data and organizing and was determined to break down the silos that harness the power, to harness the power of data, to make change in the lives of black people. For two years, Data for Black Lives has raised over $2 million, hosted two sold out conferences at the MIT Media Lab, and has changed the conversation around big data and technology across the US and globally. So when I found out about this work, I was really excited. I think it's been very generous to have been really for a lot of us. So it's just a thrill that you're here. So thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> okay, can you guys hear me? Welcome, everyone, and happy International Women's Day. Professor Crooks and Bono and Julio and everybody from the UC Irvine Informatics um, for having me. When Dr. Crooks reached out over email about this opportunity to speak and the idea for the workshop, I immediately said yes. <laughs> I mean, the work that you're doing here, I don't really see it happening much other places, and I'm really honored to be a part of it. So thank you for creating this intellectual community and having me be a part of it. Data for Black Lives is a network of over 4,000 scientists and activists working to harness the power of data and technology to make real change in the lives of black people. Data for Black Lives began with a, a, a vision, a bold, ambitious, but very possible vision of changing the role that data plays in public life. In the lives of historically oppressed people, in particular black people, by building a movement of scientists and activists equipped with the skills, the empathy, and the vision to make data a tool for profound social change instead of a weapon of oppression. I learned to collect, analyze, and use data as a high school student because early on I realized that alone we could be ignored, but that there was power in a number. When students at a neighboring high school organized a peaceful protest after a school administrator put a ninth grader in a headlock, it made national news, but not in the way that it would today. I will never forget seeing on TV footage of SWAT team units flooding the school, of police shoving the small frames of students I grew up with, I went to ele elementary school with, against police cars. On CNN and local news, the headlines read, Riot at Miami Edison Senior High School. I knew that unless we found new ways to be heard, to disrupt the narratives that facilitated this level of abuse, my future and the future of many other young people would be at stake. <clears throat> when we were turned away from public hearings and tried to talk to our elected officials about the solution that we were pushing restorative justice, um, we decided that we had to take other actions. And we surveyed 600 students about their experiences in schools and shared these findings in a comic book. For many of the young people we surveyed, that was their first time ever being asked about their experiences in schools, and at that moment they realized they weren't bad kids because they had been suspended for forgetting their ID at home, or for wearing the wrong color t-shirt under their uniform, but that this was a citywide problem, a statewide problem, and a national problem, and it was called the school to prison pipeline. Survey collection was a microphone a way to provide data that reflected the disparate impact of suspensions and arrests happening in our schools. Data was accountability and collective action for the horrific human and civil rights abuses that have been allowed to occur for far too long. Four years later, I returned to Miami after college with a renewed sense of purpose and an arsenal of skills in data collection and research that was urgently needed. I was asked to lead a reproductive justice campaign to address the infant mortality crisis, the black infant mortality crisis in Miami. Although the national infant mortality rate has decreased steadily over the past 50 years, the black infant mortality rate was and has remained constant. Mothers in the community knew that this tragedy was connected 
to hospital policies such as the aggressive marketing of infant formula and the overuse of unnecessary procedures like cesarean sections. But without data, community outcry was largely ignored. With a small team of moms, I surveyed 300 other moms on their experiences in Jackson Hospital, the largest public hospital in the country, our public hospital. And we weren't able to bring 300 mothers into the boardroom, but the hospital CEO, the director of obstetrics, everybody else was in the meeting, could not deny the data that we collected. A campaign that would have taken years to win was accomplished within months. And today, the lives of hundreds of thousands of mothers and babies have been impacted by the changes in hospital practices that we fought for. None of this would have been possible without my training as a researcher and without a collaboration of a team of data scientists. After this, I was sold on the power of data and its possibilities. But I also knew that the reality for most black communities were very different. Artificial intelligence was being used to militarize schoolyards and borders alike. Recidivism algorithms were perpetuating racism without racist. But I thought, what would it look like to take this model, my experiences, of connecting scientists and activists and bring it to scale? In August of 2016, my co-founders, <coughs> Lucas Max and I, began planning our inaugural conference, and in the process realized that we had hit a zeitgeist, just saying the four words, data for black lives. It unleashed the imaginations of so many people. From our very first roundtable meetings with community leaders to pitch our idea, to the halls of MIT where we garnered support from Black Student Union all the way to the president's office. Every day, data for black lives grew, and more and more and more people became involved. So three years and two sold out co conferences later, We've been able to build a network of over 4,000 scientists and activists. We've been able to influence and shape policy on the state and national level. And through our conferences, we've been able to convene the greatest minds on these issues of our time. But most importantly, I think the greatest metric of our success, we've been able to inspire, motivate, and activate hundreds of scientists and activists. Movement building is not the most high-tech solution, but it works. <laughs> And that brings us here, to this very moment with all of you. I'm so thrilled to speak on this topic of Abolish Big Data, because it's something that I'm cu currently working on and thinking about a lot. I first began to seriously consider this call to action to abolish big data after speaking at a congressional briefing um, that Data for Black Lives co-hosted on the Hill um, in Washington, D.C. It began with a thought experiment. What would happen if we abolish FICO, FICO credit score? <laughs> Many of the congressional staffers and legislative aides did not know that FICO was not a federal agency like many believe, but it is a Fair and Isaac Corporation, a private company that in 1956 invented and to this day owns the proprietary algorithm, the model that measures consumer risk and credit worthiness. They didn't know the origins, but they all knew its impact. I spoke about students that faced dropping out of school because they could not qualify for a private student loan. People making do with public transportation because they couldn't afford subprime car payments. And even hardworking families facing homelessness because they could not qualify to rent an apartment, all because of a three-digit number. A three-digit number that increasingly will decide whether people get hired for a job, and even someday, if we do not resist, will decide whether or not someone should stay in this country or be deported. I was amazed by the enthusiasm and support that I received when I talked about abolishing FICO. I was actually kind of shocked. <laughs> <laughs> a proprietary algorithm with so much power and so little transparency. A seemingly permanent fixture of our economic lives that many of us could not imagine a world without. I did a lot of research on credit scores and efforts within banking and financial tech to actually do it way with FICO credit scores given all the data breaches and all the other stuff that's going on with these credit reporting agencies, as well as the need for more oversight on behalf of everyday people. But I realized I couldn't stop there. I couldn't stop with FICO. There was a connection between financial tech and the ways in which the weaponization of data, or what we can call datafication, reared its ugly heads in other areas of our lives. That in my life and the lives of so many other people, the use of big data to determine risk and worthiness 
was being used to extend the shelf life of racist public policy agendas of the past, and in many cases, create new forms of racism under the guises of objectivity and neutrality. The prison abolition movement asked the question, how do we create solutions in our communities to social problems without recourse to prisons? Prisons are the engines of inequality in our society. They keep power concentrated in one place. They keep income inequality, housing inequality, constant and driving. In this talk, I apply the same abolitionist lens to big data. How can we reimagine the structures and industries that centralize big data in the hands of a few? And how can we abolish the structures that turn data into a powerful and deadly weapon? This is not a call to end the use of all data, quite the opposite. The call to abolish prisons is, a, is, a, is not a call to abolish accountability, but to abolish a punitive, violent system that is not working for our society. The, the call to abolish big data is to dismantle the oppressive structures and industry that surround its use. We know that big data is more than a collection of technologies a vast amount of information and different types of it. It is a revolution in measurement. It is more than a revolution in measurement and prediction. It has become a philosophy, an ideological regime about how decisions are made and who makes them. It has given legitimacy to a new form of social and political control that has taken the digital artifacts of our existence and found new ways to use them against us. The data is not new. It is not as novel or as revolutionary as we often worship it to be. It is a part of a long and pervasive historical legacy and technological timeline of scientific oppression, aggressive public policy, and the most influential political and economic system that has and continues to shape this country's economy, chattel slavery. Algorithms and other big data technologies are the engines that have facilitated the evolution of child slavery into the prison industrial complex and other forms of oppression. Big data and algorithms have become the workhorses of racism, denying transparency and displacing accountability. I believe today what we face and what we, what we must name is a data industrial complex where zip code is destiny Debt becomes a ball and chain weaponized by complex and obscure financial systems, where data is a strategy to rob people of political power by manipulating elections. A system and culture where archaic and racist notions of risk persist, creating narratives more powerful and impenetrable than any prison cell that could ever be built. Abolition is a process. Not an end goal, it is a rejection of prisons as the answer to the most pressing social problems. The process of abolition begins in our minds, in our organizations, our academic institutions. It is a new way of understanding the world. According to the Critical Resistance Handbook, abolitionist steps are about gaining ground in the constant effort to radically transform society. They're about chipping away at oppressive institutions rather than helping them live longer. They're about pushing critical consciousness, gaining more resources, building more larger coalitions, and developing more skills. Data for Black Lives was founded on the belief that right now we have an opportunity to abolish, reimagine, and recreate new structures of knowledge production, new forms of decision making, and new ways of relating to each other. The possibilities of what we can do with this opportunity, if we're able to see it, are infinite. We also know that the general discourse has been very negative, very fatalistic, and that's understandable. What we're facing is huge. This is a big threat. But we can't give up. That does not reflect the agency of our communities and the resilience of our movement. We have to create alternatives. And today, I'm going to talk more about what some of these examples of alternatives can look like, and I'm excited to hear some of your own stories. But first, I want to ground this all in um, some context. So this is the whole point of the PowerPoint. I, I was getting to that. <laughs> so you know, this is a presentation that I tend to do with community organizations. Recently, um, I was working a lot with folks in St. Paul, Minnesota, um, the coalition to stop the cradle to prison algorithm, which actually recently had a big success. And I'll talk more about that later. 
So, you know, community one big data zero right now. That was a big win. But, you know, I talk about risk because as we look at whether it's risk assessments or anything, this is something that comes up again and again. I actually remember the very first time I even heard the word at risk. I was in fourth grade. I was nine. And I was in the computer lab, coincidentally, and this other young lady, this uh, girl, she was like, you know, I'm in an after-school program for at-risk kids. And I was like, at risk? Like, you know, and like, there was this like, sense of fear and, and urgency. And I was like, at risk of what? And she said, you know, well, in the program, they, they tell us that, you know, we are likely to drop out of school or go to prison. And I was really shocked because, you know, I knew that even as a nine-year-old, that that was an identity that had been internalized by this young person, right? And when we think about risk and, 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 and what that means, this is one of my favorite examples of machine learning, thank God for synonyms, but, <laughs> you know, risk, proneness to harm, danger, peril, jeopardy, hazard. You know, how did we get to this point where that's, we have young people, kids, internalizing that identity. Where does that come from? And there's a huge long history, but there's some recent history that I do want to talk about. And you know, in my job at Data for Black Lives, like most of my, like most of what I do is read history because, as like I said, this goes back very far. But, you know, during the last election, there was a lot of conversation around super predators. And I think the focus was on one particular candidate and not, and it needs to be more on what does this super predator mean? Where does this come from? And how is this still persistent in today's society? And this idea of the super predator comes from John DeLulio, who's a social scientist. He worked for the Bush administration, and you know, he had this idea that, um, based on research, a new generation of street criminals is upon us. The youngest, biggest, and baddest generation any society has known. America's home, now home to thickening ranks of super predators, radically impulsive, brutally remorseless youngsters, including ever more pre-teenage boys, who murder, assault, rape, rob, burglarize, steal deadly drugs, join gun-toting gangs, and create serious communal disorders. You know, so this goes on and on and on, right? So these ideas were really essential to not just justifying people's racist notions and, and beliefs about black people and, and black youth, but it was really essential to actually fortifying policy and shaping the way to this day that young people of color are treated. So even though years later, John DeLulio like, became Catholic, and he actually said, no, none of that was true. The research wasn't based on like any real research, but you know. But this was years, this was way after like the damage had already been done, you know? So I don't, I mean, I don't know if you guys can actually see, you know, thank God we were wrong, like we overestimated how bad this was gonna be. But you know, as we know from Central Park Five, and just from every day, my story talking about how the response to a student nonviolent protest was SWAT team police cars. I even usually show the video, but I didn't have, I don't think I have time to, to show it. That is how these super predator ideals, which are research driven, were operationalized, you know, and weaponized against young people. And even earlier than that, you know, I remember growing up and hearing about the crack baby myth, and that still being persistent. Um, and that, again, was based on research by Ira Chasnoff from Northwestern. And it wasn't until, I guess, 2013 when the New York Times released this um, uh, study that followed up with participants who are, are, are part of the original research, that, again, it was decided that this whole idea that there was going to be generations of young people born who were addicted to crack and would be a burden on society of course, none of that came to pass. And, and I think the crazy thing about this study was that it was based on only 23 participants. And when they followed up with one of the participants, the young girl, she had like graduated from college, was a person her, you know, family, like was like such an exceptional case. So what they realized that instead of drugs or whatever, the biggest factor contributing to outcomes, negative life outcomes, was in fact poverty, right? But again, that's a lot easier, that's a lot harder to address you know, socially then, drugs, where you could just lock people up. I, another important myth that I think I often talk about, especially, um, I'll talk a little bit more about the research that I did in Miami, but was this welfare queen idea, you know? And that was specifically used to, based on stereotypes around black women, around who received welfare, around our families, um, 
you know, and I always talk about this, but like, you know, around this time, the, the, the mass incarceration rate of black men was increasing. And later on now, we have research that shows that the eviction rate of black women was ana analogous to the incarceration rate of black men. So what does that mean, right? So in the age of big data, if we're not aware of this history, we risk repeating it. And that's a good use of the word risk. That's actually relevant. <laughs> you know, we have to think about this. Too often, you know, we act like the models or the algorithms or even the data that we're using is totally neutral, it's ahistorical, and it's not. Um, and this is a diagram that we created um, that I use when I talk about algorithms and I explain their function. I know folks generally know, raise your hand if you know what an algorithm is or machine learning. Okay, great. So I'm pretty surprised. I don't have to get into the whole, but you know, we, we know that the basic model is input, output, black box algorithm, but often the, all this on top it, is ignored, right? And that, these histories and values, not only does it inform and um, influence the training data, the input that trains the model and the output, but it really um, influences what we call the objective function, which is the question of what are we trying to optimize, right? When I, give, when I use like the salad, uh, analogy to talk about algorithms like you know like the like, like an algorithm as a recipe and um, when we're creating a recipe we have to think about what would success look like do we want it to be healthy do we want it to be unhealthy um, that's what that's what we ask when we're asking what are we optimizing and we're talking about the objective function but um yeah so so one of the things I think about a lot when we talk about not just abolish big data um, and the ways in which algorithms influence people's lives and the ways in which, you know, we talk about these big data artifacts continuing to increase the shelf life of aggressive public policy, zip code is a really big thing, you know? Um, and I don't know if you guys are familiar, but um, these are, this is a map of Miami and this is analysis done by the um, NCRC, National Community Reinvestment Council. And they use the old homeowners loan corporation maps, which were created under the New Deal, okay? And you know, so when we talk about the New Deal, we have to be historical too. And when we talk about how much it costs, we have to talk about a lot of the New Deal was at the expense of black communities and it caused black failure. So, what happened was that the green areas, um, there was a whole color scheme that was associated with it. Green was for the best areas. Yellow was for declining. Pur purple was for um, still desirable. And red was obviously for hazardous. So when we think about the, the word hazardous and the label hazardous being used to quantify, being used to identify people's communities, and the ways in which that was translated, again, into policy, Folks who lived in hazardous areas were not allowed to have access to credit. They were deemed as being risky to lend to. They were, they were deemed as being not credit worthy. And what does that mean years later? Disinvestment, lack of infrastructure, lack of property taxes to fund public education, um, lack of resources for people to own homes, and definitely an absence of funding for public housing. And this shows what, what the analysis that, that they were trying to do here was showing that how, even to this day, if you look at these old maps and where these hazardous des designations were, there still is persistent inequality happening. And I often talk about zip codes when we're thinking back to this idea of credit scores, right? Because zip codes are a proxy for race, right? We don't need to have explicit racial variables when we're thinking about and when we're developing models like the FICO credit score because of the ways in which zip code um, reflects segregation and the ways in which black communities were being isolated into specific areas. So I said earlier about FICO and about Bill Fair and Earl Isaac and you know a mathematician and an engineer who started FICO and who had this idea that they wanted to use big data as a way to Reimagine risking and, and lending. Um, 
this study is talking about how um, it was an 80,000 study, 80,000 population study, and it revealed that even though when you were controlling for income, when you were controlling for the amount of debt, which is supposed to be like the main indicators of what someone's credit score is going to be, there were market differences in credit scores based on the <coughs> code. So white people versus black people, market differences. And of course, we really can't do much more research and actually really understand what's under the hood because the FICO credit score algorithm is a proprietary algorithm. Mm -hmm. So you would need like a gang of lawyers and more in order to actually really do the research and see what's going on. But I use this example because this is one of the ways in which, again, zip code is being used as a proxy for race. And even though the Fair Housing Act made segregation illegal, big data is keeping segregation alive. Another example, this was a great, 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 great study by ProPublica where they looked at car insurance premiums. And I, mean, I don't even really have to say much, right? Like, you look at where the hazardous <laughs> designations are, and you look at where people are paying the most in terms of car insurance premiums. And growing up in Miami, it was always known that if you wanted lower car insurance rates, you have to get somebody who lives on, on Miami Beach and get their zip code and sign up and have it mailed to, to their house. Because even though there was more crime happening on Miami Beach, because there's clubs and there's partying and there's drugs, <laughs> you know, it was always going to be cheaper than our neighborhoods, which were Little Haiti, Miami Shores, black neighborhoods. And, you know, this might not seem like that important, but if you're a working father, if you're a single mom, if, if you're a student and you're having to pay 30% more in car insurance than folks who live in wealthy neighborhoods or you can't afford to drive to work. You can't afford to do basic things, right? What does that actually mean for folks' daily lives? If you haven't seen this study, I definitely you are checking it out. And this is another slide that I included about, um, I know folks have probably seen this before, and I know people will talk today a lot about Compass and about risk assessments. I'm really excited about that. But going back to this idea of proxies of race and the ways in which Big data has been able to, like, again, extend the shelf life of aggressive public policies and has been able to really, really be weaponized against communities. You know, this is a situation where they're not necessarily even using training data and historical data in order to develop risk assessments, which is a tool to decide how long folks are going to spend in jail. And if you look at some of these questions, right, how many of your friends or acquaintances have ever been arrested? Were you ever suspended? Like, who gets suspended in this country? Right? Who gets arrested? Even questions like, how often do you feel bored? Or, true or false, a hungry person has a right to steal. You know, and uh, again, another amazing ProPublica study where they're <coughs> able to get um, under the hood and really understand how these risk, risk assessments are working, but a 16-year-old girl from Florida who like got in trouble because of like a neighborhood scuffle or whatever, got more time in prison than a white career criminal because of these risk assessments because of these questions, because of the ways in which these, these questions, again, were being used to proxy the race. So we all know this. This is what's happening right now. These are the present context and things that we're fighting against. But again, at Data for Black Lives, we believe that data is a tool for profound social change. Or it can be a weapon of social warfare, depending on whose hands it's in. We believe that data is protest, you know? And that some narratives were created by data, and they, and they can only be disrupted by data. And that data is a form of protest when all other channels are blocked. And I'm going to pass around some. These are actually, oh my God, all my paper to get all this organized there, but these are actually the two reports that we did. This is the comic book that we did in high school, where we surveyed 600 students. And from this comic book, I mean, by the time I graduated, that was in 2008, we were, getting, we were gaining some traction. We were still like these crazy kids coming to the school board talking about restorative justice, you know, and getting kicked out of meetings. But by 2014, the country caught up, the Obama administration caught up, and eventually our school district caught up, where because of efforts at the federal level to release data from the Office of Civil Rights, we were able to disaggregate data by school by gender to prove our point where before we had no data except for what we collected. I'll pass these around for folks to take a look at it. Um, 
Um, yeah, so, and then finally, the school district decided that, yes, restorative justice practices, we have to fund it, and in 2014, I was a part of an effort to actually train up school principals in Dade County in restorative practices, and, and we got it fully funded. But that took years, right? That took years of us pushing back. And with the report on um, breastfeeding, I could talk more about that as well. What we were coming up against wasn't just, you know, the lack of information around black infant mortality. I was a college graduate. I knew really nothing about breastfeeding, very little about what was really happening in the hospitals. And even in the progressive movement, we were having a lot of pushback because women's health continues to be marginalized. And we were, we were also pushing back against, you know, this, these prevailing notions around black women, about black moms, around Latina moms, around poor moms. And even though that campaign, when I joined it, was about to be over, it was like we were losing funding. My job was only literally to finish a survey. <laughs> You know, and that's it. But I said, no, I'm going to finish this survey. I can do that. We also have to try to find a way to use this data to fight back. And after four years, again, I came at the very end, we were able to win this campaign because we collected our own data and because we presented it to them. And I remember being in the meeting, and they were like, you guys did this all yourself. Uh, How did you do it? I said, you know, we, it really wasn't that difficult. And we did it because we had to. Right? Because your policies, your practices in the hospitals are actually killing our young people, our families. So that was, data was our form of protest, even when we were dealing with a ton of repression in so many different ways. Um, data is accountability. So last year, I was, you know, in the middle of a Cambridge Analytica scandal. Like, we were privy to it. I knew about Cambridge Analytica for years. And I remember watching the congressional hearings and first of all, seeing the lack of awareness around algorithms and algorithmic bias in Congress, but also just being kind of frustrated with how limited the conversation was. You know, so that inspired me to write an open letter to Facebook on behalf of the Data for Black Lives movement where we were making really bold demands. You know, the first being that we wanted, I mean, really to give black researchers, data scientists, and black communities access to our data. The first was that we wanted Facebook to do a public data trust. The second is to develop a code of ethics. Just like UC Irvine or any other school has to have an IRB approval, who had to go through IRB in order to do research? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> why, why shouldn't Facebook have to do that? And not an internal IRB, external. Mm. And then the third was to hire black data scientists. And I knew, you know, Facebook's an advertising co company. I knew that asking for their data was going against their, re their revenue model. But that's exactly why I did that. Right? Because I would spend so much time, like me being a nerd, going on research.facebook.com and seeing all the amazing things that their researchers were able to do with this wealth of our data. Like, they were able to look at, like, housing prices at, at like, a micro level and see, like, gentrification and, using, you know, using all these real estate ads to actually track things and ask questions that we just couldn't ask. You know, they have more access to data around disaster preparedness than, like, government agencies do. Forget about black infant mortality and you know health data. Like they have so many tools, sentiment analysis, survey tools that really, really, really I felt honestly jealous because that can help our movement, help our folks so much. So that was really the push behind this, and it really kind of launched a whole advocacy campaign um, that my one of my co-founders and at the head of policy and strategy Max developed out uh, called hashtag Senate Strategy, where we followed up with a lot of our senators, a lot of officials and said, hey, like, you guys didn't have anything real to ask Mark Zuckerberg. Here are some demands that you could have done. <laughs> and, you know, Cory Booker's office, I, you know Cory Booker? I love his hair. I love his legislative aides. They're great. His teams are great. If you guys are interested in any advocacy, those are the folks you have to go to. The legislative aides, the staffers. Um, Cory Booker ended up endorsing our demands and pretty much word by word submitted his own letter publicly to Mark Zuckerberg. And I thought this was especially important too because Booker was somebody that years before his mayor accepted $100 million from Mark Zuckerberg to fund schools in Newark, which, you know, as an education justice organizer by training and, and by at heart bothers me, but I thought it was important for us, again, this is why we make these bold demands. This is why we say abolish big data or make demands of Facebook because we have to, and it was so important for us to give these demands to Booker 
for him to make them of Mark Zuckerberg, right? And I think that's the role that we're continuing to play as, as we work with folks. So this has led to us being involved in a very interesting process with Facebook called their Civil Rights Audit. Um, and, you know, I before this, I worked at colorofchange.org, um, and, and, and my role there was developing out this platform called Organized School, which was the first online petition platform for um, black people to launch petitions, black campaigns. And I was, I was not really involved, but I was around when the Airbnb civil rights audits happened. So I knew a bit about what the process was going to be. So our focus never was to fight Facebook and win. You know, our focus was to continue to educate our communities. When I hear people come to me and say, wow, like now when things happen, which they're going to continue to happen involving Facebook, I actually understand. I understand how it affects me, it, it affects my community, I can speak out about it, and I can take action. So in addition to that, and you know, we're continuing to do the public data trust, we're continuing to work with Facebook. Um, one of the things that I gave you at our last conference was um, the nutrition labels for algorithms. So there's been a lot of awesome efforts with data nutrition, um, data nutrition labels out of MIT, some great, some great, great, great work with um, uh, Kathy O'Neill's um, algorithmic auditing, a lot of work to really work um, to bring transparency, demystify algorithms, and also bring accountability. For us, our focus is really from the people side, right? Like, first of all, a lot of our folks don't even know, A, when they're even interacting with an algorithm, much less that it's biased. So how do we get people from there, right? So whether it's car insurance algorithm, college admission, Facebook newsfeed, child welfare, FICO scores, developing labels and ways for, for people to actually, again, know that they're dealing with an algorithm and know what it means for their lives. And this is like a very early prototype. I have other images and pictures, but come to the next conference, you'll see more about that. <laughs> but this was really important to me because, as I said, like, you know, I would explain algorithms and algorithmic injustice and bias to my grandma, you know, honestly the same way that I would explain it to some of our folks in Congress. And my grandma understands it better because she's like more directly impacted, but <laughs> you know, I think on all levels, we need more literacy around algorithms, we need more understanding around it, and we need to find ways that make it accessible, whether it's, you know, thinking back about the, the comic book or other ways that we can actually get this information to the ground, get it in the hands of people so that they can advocate for themselves, but also for their communities. So this is an example of something that we developed. You know, this, this, this has been like a really long process working with folks from UC Berkeley researchers, as well as my friend um, who started a graphic design company um, called United Artists and Strategists. And as you can see, we're still developing how the language and we have these labels that we created in, um, that are very, very, very technical looking. And we're really experimenting in ways that we can make it accessible, whether you're using like, interactive games, um, and most importantly, working with folks who are in local government to actually get them implemented. So from the conference, we're really building on a team of people to work on this. And if you're interested, please let me know. Um, because whether, you know, our main focus is first getting it implemented in Boston and, and New York City, but out here, that's really, really urgent. So we also believe that data is data is collective action, right? That's a that's a that's a huge huge thing, you know. What we're doing is movement building, organizing wins, organizing works. I believe it. I believe in organizing, and I know that it's true because recently, as I mentioned earlier, we've had a really 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 big win. So about a year and a half ago, some folks from St. Paul reached out to me. And they said, you know, we, we need help, right? We're education justice organizers. We've been working in the schools. We have a coalition of black organizers, native organizers. And we really, really, really um, are dealing with something very difficult. So the Ramsey County Sheriff's Office, um, which is in St. Paul, Minnesota, the, the school district, and a ton of other agencies were conspiring together to develop what, what they call a joint powers agreement around data sharing. And they were going to develop what's called risk ratios based on historical data from these agencies and use those risk ratios <coughs> as a way to allocate resources, identify interventions, whatever, for young people of color, in particular in Ramsey County. 
And in the context of the school to prison pipeline, we know what that was going to look like, right? Before you try to use big data to do all this other stuff, let's first address what's really wrong here, which is these systemic problems happening in our schools. So folks came together and really worked to stop it. And this is a picture of me. You can see me in there. But we, I partnered with them doing trainings, working with folks in the community to develop demands, having summits, doing a lot of public education around this, and really kind of like a lot of work on the ground to really call out elected officials who were involved. And it was announced about three weeks ago that St. Paul, Ramsey County is totally dissolving this effort, right? They're not going to move forward with the Joint Powers Agreement um, because of the work that that folks were doing. And remember, this was something that started off real quiet. A lot of these big data policies and stuff happened real quiet and behind the scenes. And for us, collective action also means organizing people in our own spaces, right? So a big, big, big thing that I talk about and I've said enough, multiple times are our conferences, right? So. When I had the idea for Data for Black Lives, I was like, how do we even start this, you know? And me putting my organizer hat on, I said, let's just bring people in the room who have already been talking about it, get them connected, and let's see what happens there. We had our first conference in November 2017. We had our second conference um, a couple months ago. And I think the most powerful thing, one of the most powerful things, there's so much that that, that has come out, but we've been really shifting the perspective in the, around who actually are experts on these topics, right? I, I was very intentional. My job all year long is coming up with panels, coming up with you know, really cool panel names, like Black People versus Robots, <laughs> but um, really thinking about who is having these conversations, how can I put them on stage, how can we put, honestly, thousands of dollars of live stream and you know, all this behind them to get their voices out there. And this was the opening panel at our conference with me, Joy Bulawimi, Tamika Lewis, Teresa Hodge, and Rashida Richardson, and so many people, but I've never seen an all-black woman panel talking about algorithmic accountability. You know, 85% of our panelists were women, and about 90%, or I would say 85, 80% 80 were black. You know, and that's very intentional, and honestly, I had so many more people I could have invited to speak. Like, I, like, there's, there's no lack of people to talk about these issues. There's... No lack of expertise on this, you know? And, and, and if you can't find black panelists and female panelists for your conference, you are not looking. <laughs> so finally, as I wrap up, you know, I ask the question again, like, what are we optimizing? And for Data for Black Lives, we're optimizing collective action. We're optimizing love. We're optimizing caring for each other, you know? And that, again, is not very high tech, but it's essential. Too long, we've been living in a world where, whether it's through big data or prison industrial complex or whatever, we've, we've allowed these systems to take the place of real connectivity and real community. And we really, 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 really devalue people's lives. You know, people ask me, what is Data for Black Lives about? Yes, Data for Black Lives is about building the leadership of scientists and activists, absolutely. Yes, it is about to, you know, changing the narrative and making bold demands and using the datafication of our society to make bold demands for racial justice. But really, at its core, Data for Black Lives is about life, you know? It's about protecting the, the sanctity of life. It's about making sure that people have their needs met, you know? And this is just like a beautiful photo of some of the people from our conference um, who came and who joined us. And I think I'll stop there if anybody has any questions. Yeah, I think 
you know, we've been, I, most of the people that I know and that, like, train me, like, I, I remember being in Oakland for a youth organizing training and, like, Alicia Garza talking about, like, t tactics and strategy, you know? So I'm definitely, like, a child of that movement. And I think formally we've been able to really, really use the Data for Black Lives Conference especially as a space to, like, lift up some of the demands that folks have been making around policing, around housing, but really, really talking about them through the lens of data and like really, like really, really like pushing those, reasserting those demands. So, so one of the com so last year, I mean, this most recent conference, for example, we had um, Marbury Wallace Studs from um, Law for Black Lives and also leadership team for Movement for Black Lives. Um, I made sure she was like front and center on our panel, abolition and the age of things. A, because I knew that, you know, we're not quite abolition, this is a new concept for people, and especially, you know, our crowd is like MIT folks, researchers, this is new. How do we, you know, use her speaking and the work that, that she's doing, as well as Janae Bonds, who from BYP 100, to really talk about, like, what they're doing now and how folks can get involved, but also pushing back, right? Like, pushing people's understanding of, oh, you know, I'm an MIT researcher, I have not, nothing you put, that, that I do is related to, like, how many black people are getting child crime that's not true, you know? And also, I think, really kind of trying to change the cast of characters around who's involved in the movement as well, right? I think the best thing is like, the most beautiful thing is, is seeing folks that I know who are like, hardcore, badass activists, being at the same table with like, software engineers and people who are like, you know, how can I help? I can build this, I can do that, let's work together. So, yeah. You know, and as we continue to have a conference, as, as, as we continue to roll out campaigns and stuff, there's going to be, like, a lot more, right? Yeah, please, go ahead. And remember, say your name, too, please. Sure, hi, Yeshi. Great talk. My name is Alyssa Richardson, and I'm a journalism professor at USC. And I have a lot of questions, well, just one question specifically for my students. Um, I train them to use only mobile devices to do journalism. Mm -hmm. And in the last couple of years, we've seen it has propelled the movement, but now there's a lot of pushback from the platforms as well as law enforcement mm -hmm. for people who are bearing witness in that way. Mm -hmm. And so a number of them have asked me, can you go and ask her how we can do data journalism and tell mm -hmm. different stories and numbers when this thing is getting us into trouble? Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. I would just add a great data journalism happy hour last night with Joan. Don't no brought us out there. <laughs> And I got to meet all these great data journalists. You know, I, that's a long answer, but one of the things that I had, an idea that I had inspired by last night was, you know, as, as part of the conference, we have pre-conference sessions. And I think one of the pre-conference sessions next year, I want to be data journalists and, 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 and folks interested in that coming together. And we've had folks come to the conference and be part of the conversation, but how do we have people who are currently doing the work and people who want to do the work? Because we need them <coughs> that, right? Like we're seeing, how, I have an article in my bag actually, but I saw it at Starbucks yesterday, and I was sitting down, and, and, and it was like USA Today, and it was about how, you know, new data revealed that hospital practices were contributing to black women, you know, dying after giving birth. And I was like, wow, we've been saying this, you know? But also, you know, they were able to, to I think, use like lawsuit data, and, and just really creative uses of data to, again, bring home this point of we have to look at what's happening in the hospital. So there's so much possibilities around that, and there's a lot of really creative ways. Last year, well, last conference we had a, a public record request workshop um, where folks were trained up and, and, and how to use FOIA, how to use pu public record requests to get data sources. But there's a, there's so much more that I could talk about. So we have to, we have to talk later, because this is actually, this could be, this free conference session is an idea that I had just last night, so there you go. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, I'm Harmony Parker. She, her, you get me. Um, so you kept mentioning um, abolition, and I know you and Janet really helped you like, form these kinds of like, conferences and things like that. So I want to know like, how that influenced you to make these conferences around instead of like reform, like more like numbers. Yes, great question. Yeah, I, w I have to say, you know, I was really lucky to be exposed to that. I remember. My freshman year of college, like when I had just left Miami and I was like I'd been an organizer and I was not, and now I was in college. And I got a chance to go to 
critical resistance 10 year anniversary. So critical resistance is a prison abolition organization signed by Ruby Gilmore, Angela Davis, a few others that you mentioned involved in. It was in San Francisco, that was my first time ever in the Bay Area, and I was just amazed. I was amazed by, A, the fact that like, for years, like this was the 10th anniversary folks had, had been working on this. Um, I was amazed by the fact that 3,000 people showed up, but also, I think that made me like a lifelong abolitionist in a way, right? Like, I, like, you know, you say now, like, okay, abolish prisons. Prisons have become a, like a permanent fixture in our lives. Like, like, people can't imagine a world without <coughs> incarceration. It takes a lot of like faith. It takes a lot of um, imagination to even get to that point. And I think even more so, just applying the abolitionist framework to our work. When people ask us, for example, so how can I get involved? I always say, what's going on where you live? Because not in my backyard, maybe that's a big part of abolitionist work. What's going on where you live? Let's get us connected to what's happening where you live, right? Because yes, we're doing work on a national level, please be in involved in that, but there's a lot that you can do right where you are. You know, it may not seem like a lot, but yeah. Um, and I think what else? And honestly, too, I've been doing a lot of reading and research on the you know, primordial original social reform movement in this country, which was the movement to abolish slavery. And if you look at that movement, if you look at what was happening years ago, even though that's a project that's still continuing, um, it was a multiracial, multigenerational movement that was black-led, where women were the main like foot soldiers, and that was what we needed in order to get to the point where, okay, slavery, chattel slavery, in some cases, are no, it's, is no longer legal. And I think that really inspires the way that we think about our movement. Yes, it's Day of the Black Lives, but this has to be multiracial. It has to be multi-generational, and it absolutely has to be interdisciplinary. So thank you for that question. Universal basic income, when you think about 
um, where we're headed in terms of automation. You, you, you can look at the experiences of black people in this country and like you can learn a lot. Like this already happened in Detroit. This already happened in Gary, Indiana. What was the response? How did people, what, what did people do? And I think for us, it's, it's, it's constantly looking at history, constantly looking at what folks are doing now on the ground. And again, I'm going to say it over and over again, making bold demands <laughs> and creating solutions and interventions. That's wonderful. Let's do one more I'm in the back, please. Okay. Hello, my name is Shadice Campbell. I'm an assistant professor here in the School of Education. And so I teach a mixed methods class, and so I'm heavy quant. So I wanted to know more about how does your work infuse mixed methods, so both quant and qualitative methods, to, to kind of tell a story and move a mo and, and kind of create a movement. Great, yes, yes. I always say that my personal experiences, anecdotal data has been like the most potent and powerful data that I've ever had, you know? And yes, we're in a world where we, especially in the big data world that we live in, it's quant, 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 numbers, numbers, but for us, hearing people's experiences, speaking to people again, whether it was doing the survey collection and talking to people, uh, whether it was, uh, you know, the work that we're doing now in developing these labels, right? Like, yes, we can get into the nitty gritty and technical around fairness and around precision and around parity and all that other kind of very technical language, or we can actually really talk to people and hear about their experiences and, and use those experiences and find ways to go. And I think, um, I don't know, I can talk a lot about mixed methods. That's really what I got my training in. My thesis around was around um, risk and resilience and African-American youth in the city. And it was a half GIS study looking at maps and similar to these hope maps, but looking at some of the mapping resources that we have with data in Miami. But most importantly, it was a lot of interviews, a lot, a lot of interviews actually talking to people about their experiences and hearing how they understand the experiences and, and how they define risk and how they define resilience. So, so I would love to talk to you more about that because um, when we're talking about abolishing big data, <laughs> that's what we mean, right? Not just small data, but also people's experiences. What do we privilege? What do we see as information? What do we see as knowledge production? Um, and how does that actually inform our agenda? Mm, that's so wonderful. I feel like we have a lot to talk about, right? <laughs> Let me do some quick thank yous, though. So I want to thank the, uh, the Informatics Department's Master of Human Computer Interaction and Design for sponsoring our speaker. I also want to thank the whole Department of Informatics, which also contributed funding for the whole workshop. So thanks to them. And of course, for our wonderful speaker, thank you so much.